Chief Joe Powell comes to us from Rialto, California, where he has been a member of Rialto's Fire Command uh, for the last 15 years and a practicing paramedic in the uh, county for some 29 plus years. He currently runs the Transport and Non-Transport EMS Medical Services Division of Rialto Fire Department. Chief is a leader in innovative patient care with articles published in Western Journal of Emergency Medicine three times in the past uh, two years. He's been awarded two United States patents for his work. Along with the Rialto Fire Department, he is presently plotting five-year pre-hospital, uh, participating in pre-hospital care trial studies. He leads Rialto's Fire's nationally recognized drowning prevention program and is currently working with the state legislators to pass legislation requiring unified data collection and analysis in all water submersion injuries. Please welcome to the stage, Chief Joe Powell. Morning. You hear me? Oh, there we go. <laughs> Morning. You guys are in a little bit of trouble right off the bat. So there's like my third cup of coffee and I already talk fast, so you guys gotta listen fast. Deal? All right, so this is me, what, that's me over there too, right? Hey, you guys, you guys promised you put a filter on there that made me look like Brad Pitt. No? All right. All right, so we're gonna talk about doing CPR on the moon. Anybody ever done CPR on the moon? No? I thought maybe because you guys are like famous for uh, Jim Lovell, right? Astronaut? Am I right? In Ohio? Born in Ohio? No? Am I? Neil Armstrong? Okay. Okay. You're famous for some astronauts, right? Yeah, so I thought maybe you guys, somebody here, you know, done CPR on the moon. Imagine the, uh, the complications of doing CPR on the moon, right? You do one compression and you fly away into space, that's a problem, right? You have to tether yourself to the patient or something, that'd be terrible. All right, so we're gonna talk more about that in a minute. You see this clicker? This clicker is cool, right? It only has a couple buttons and they're like really big and like, hey dummy, just push this button. Like that. <laughs> so we also, uh, this title is Un Unlearning What You Think You Know About Cardiac Arrest. Because to learn something, you have to unlearn what you already know. And so we're gonna talk about that. Brought to you by the men and women of the Rialto Fire Department. Because they do it. I don't, right, I drive a desk. So I'm a file fighter, as they say. <clears throat> so they do it every day, they make this work, and so it's really brought to you by them. Uh, so disclosures, real quick, this is not me. I do not uh, do cash angels. I'm not making boatloads of money. I've been trying to talk somebody into paying me boatloads of money, but it hasn't happened yet, so. I have no disclosures. You guys ready? Here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna teach you everything I know about cardiac arrest. Two minutes. In two minutes, then you guys can go home. You don't have to worry about the rest of the speakers. You'll know everything you need to know. Two minutes, I'll have you guys out of here. Deal? Deal? Deal. I will need some of your help though. So I'll ask a couple questions, I'll need an answer and we'll, we'll move through this pretty quickly, all right? So it's kind of a participation sport. Ready? You ready, we need to do toe touchies or calisthenics to get warmed up, no? All right, here we go. What is this? I'm sorry, what is this? Existently, I agree. What does it mean in your department? Right, I mean, is that not what it means in all of our departments? You see a guy in asystole, you're like, yeah, I'm gonna be back having lunch in 20 minutes. I'm gonna start a line, drop a tube, give some epi, we're gonna call him and then I'll be back 15, 20 minutes, we'll be back at the station, right? That's what it means to all of us. Nobody lives in asystole, right? Okay. A little bit different in my city. So right now we're running about 39% ROSC rate in asystole. All right, so we kind of got that one wrong, but okay, what is this? V-fib, very good, a good job, still kind of two for two. What do you do with V-fib? Absolutely, you shock it, right? For those of you that are under 40, those thingies that the guy's holding onto are called paddles, 
right? You don't just go to the monitor and push a button. You lube them up and put them on there. Boof. That's cool stuff. <clears throat> the chicks dig it when you defibrillate like that. You defibrillate V-fib, right? All right. Eh, not where I come from. Not all V-fib. Maybe. Yes. No. I'll tell you. But we don't defibrillate all V-fibs. Okay, this should be easier. This is CPR, right? This is how you do it. You do it flat on a hard surface, hands in the middle of the chest, push hard, push fast. That's how we do CPR, right? Nope. It's not how I do CPR in my city. We do it completely differently. Oh, okay, this one's easier, right? It even says it. It's epinephrine. Right? What do we do with epinephrine? Give it to cardiac arrest patients, look really cool, we squirt it in the air and pop the little things and, right? <clears throat> That's what we do with epi? Maybe. Maybe. Maybe eventually. We'll talk about it. Not always, not first line, and not when you get there. There are incredible organizations all throughout the country who are doing wonderful things with Usteen, and I applaud them for that, and we will take as much of their knowledge base as possible to plug into our program. My biggest problem with uh, Utstein, not a problem with Utstein, but in trying to provide service to the city of Rialto is that that's such a small percentage of our cardiac arrest victims. And uh, just like we don't want to discriminate based on where you live, what you do for a living, or any other aspect. I don't want to discriminate it based on what rhythm you're in. So if we wanted to be known for something, and we don't, we just want to do our job, meet our mission, take care of the city. Um, but if we want to be known for something, it would be finding ways to translate what we can, th those high success rates that we can have with that scene into a rhythm neutral approach. Nothing beats high quality CPR, and we really do mean nothing. We won't stop it to innovate. Uh, we won't stop it to start an IV. We won't stop it to check a rhythm. Uh, we won't stop it. We won't even stop it if we think it might be ROSC because even if the heart just started beating, there's no endogenous perfusion pressure at that point. So we might as well let the autopulse do its job and build that up so that when we do turn it off, it doesn't revert back to its underlying rhythm. Uh, it is my job absolutely to uh, champion the cause of, uh, of both our fire and EMS folks. Uh, we really do, as we spoke about earlier, uh, our goal simply is uh, neurologically intact survival from sudden cardiac arrest. There's no percentage, there's no value, there's no anything else. It doesn't matter which part of town you live in, how much money you make, and really we're just about investing our efforts in that process of making that happen. Yeah, like going back, I've been in EMS for eight years and I had two cardiac saves prior to working here. And in the last 22 months, I've had 16. With all my heart. Every bone in my body, thank you. And I appreciate them and I honor what they do. So you'll notice Chief Grayson, you have to be bald to be in the, to get a chief's job in the Rialto Fire Department, but you notice Chief Grayson talked about Edstein a little bit there and why he wasn't that concerned about Edstein. Right? Everybody know what Edstein is? So witness cardiac arrest. Um, with CPR prior to arrival and found in a shockable rhythm. That's Utstein. That's Utstein criteria, and everybody wants to tout their Utstein criteria. That's cool, except about 20% of my patients are Utstein criteria. 80% of my patients aren't. So I need to save the Utsteins, but I need to save the rest of them. Right? So, important. This is our mission statement. And you see here that uh, in our mission statement, the, the word innovation. So we are committed to meet the public's needs with compassionate service, professionalism, and innovation. So I have to innovate. I don't have a choice. If I'm not innovating on a regular basis, I'm not meeting my mission statement. So down here in the vision, an organization that brings value to the community, measured in lives saved and quality of life protected. So not just saving lives, not just saving property, but the quality of life. Are they neurologically intact? Right? Are we bringing back people with a quality of life? You should set yourself up for, for, for success in this process. When you write your mission, vision, values, you should set yourself up. 
Also, it doesn't hurt when I go and say, hey, chief, I need this innovative new device, and it's going to save lives and improve the quality of life. It's going to cost a lot of money. And he's like, oh, no. Well, wait a minute. What's our mission statement say? Right? What's our, what's our, what's our vision statement say? He's like, all right, I, I, I know, I know. <clears throat> so we're talking about national average ROSC, right? And I know CPC scores, neurologically intact survival, those are the most important things, right? That's the gold standard. We want to be there. But we're talking about ROSC rates for a little bit. And so CARES number in ROSC is a little bit higher, but those are people that report. Would you agree with me the people that report to CARES have a higher, su higher success rate than people that don't? Because they're reporting. They're measuring. They're looking at it, right? So we're somewhere around 10%. And by the way, if I haven't said this already, I'm going to make some people uncomfortable or unhappy. And um, that's just part of the process, right? So I'm going to kind of challenge what you believe. And I apologize. But... Um, I think you'll like me at the end. I have a security detail that follows me around after, so if I say anything really bad, you guys won't hurt me. 10% <clears throat> ROSC, national average. Whose fault is it? We're going to find some fault. And why is that acceptable? Why is 10% ROSC acceptable? Because it is across our business. Oh. <clears throat> This is it. This is the problem. This is, you know what this thing is? I gotta stand over here, because it might hurt me. <clears throat> right, this is an endotracheal tube. I would have brought one, but TSA won't let me carry them, right, because they're too, just too dangerous. <clears throat> or it's a piece of plastic we use properly will benefit your patient, and when you use it improperly, will hurt your patient, right? So is it his fault? Nah, it's not really his fault. Now, what's this thing here? Bag valve mask. Is it his fault? No. Hmm. It might be the guy's fault behind the bag valve mask, who's squeezing it 40 times a minute. Might be. But realistically, it's not his fault. Yeah, it's the man in the mirror, right? It's on us. We have to challenge our beliefs. We have to challenge what we've been taught. We have to unlearn what we already know. Because what we currently know is getting us 10% ROSC. This is 100% unacceptable. <clears throat> this is a, let me ask you this question. This may be a bad guy for you guys, I don't know. But uh, um, if this guy missed 50% of his field goals, 50%, what are we doing next week? Watch it on TV, right? He'll be, he'll be flipping burgers at McDonald's, right? He will not be kicking field goals. If he misses 50%, he's flipping burgers. In a game, you're dealing with lives. 90% of your patients are dying? I almost said a bad word, but I was told I can't say bad words. <clears throat> so there you go, just for you guys in the back. So you got to unlearn what you think you know. Because what you think you know is getting in the way of doing it right. I'm going to challenge you. So what you think you know, what you ta were taught, the people that are writing the protocols, that are, that are writing the procedures, that are writing the books, are doing it wrong. When you have 90% fatality, they're doing it wrong. So you can go down this path here, 10% ROSC, or you can go with me, 60% ROSC. That's all comers. Outside of rigor and lividity, that is witnessed, unwitnessed, that is a Sicily PEA, VFib, uh, CPR prior to arrival, no CPR prior to arrival, regardless of downtime, 60% ROSC. You can choose your path here. <clears throat> I'm, not, I'm not in the uh, how to win friends and influence people path right here, so you're going to have to excuse this statement. It's a statement, actually, every time I read it, I'm a little uncomfortable. But The problem is not that people are uneducated. The problem is that they are educated just enough to believe what they have been taught and not educated enough to question what they have been taught. 
you're in a program since the day you started, you've been rewarded for doing what you've been taught and not varying from that. And you gotta start questioning that. What ship is that, anybody? Titanic, yeah. Probably didn't work out too well there, huh? <clears throat> so cardiac arrest failures, when we first looked at this, there's a lot of things going on here. Too much time off the chest. If I teach you anything here, it's too much time off the chest. Too much time off the chest, too much time off the chest. This is it, this is the problem. Too much reliance on ALS before BLS. I love ALS, right? I'm a paramedic. I wanna get out there and I wanna pop caps and screw stuff together and squirt flu fluid in the air and defibrillate and innovate and do all the cool stuff, just like you do. Unfortunately, that stuff's not saving lives. Drugs don't save lives in cardiac arrest. <clears throat> Overventilation, huge issue. Too quick to transport, we'll talk about that. Way too quick to get off scene. Ah. See, I'll make you mad, but eventually I think I'll make you happy. Who's this guy? Anybody know who this guy is? Who? Chet. <laughs> Ocho Cinco, right? Chad Ocho Cinco, right? I'm not a big football guy, but he's doing his very best manual compressions here. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about high-quality manual CPR. And I want you to tell me what these two things have in common. So what high quality manual is CPR and this guy have in common? Yeah, they don't exist. Neither one of them exists. And I will stop saying that the minute somebody comes up to me and says, I can show you real data on a real patient over the course of 30 minutes that we're doing high quality manual compressions with good compression fraction, with good depth, with good recoil and good rate. If you can show me actual data, I'll shut up. Nobody, and I don't, I spoke in South Korea, I spoke in Indonesia, I've spoken in uh, London, I've spoken in Germany, I've been in Taiwan, and nobody can show me this. It doesn't happen. I am sorry if that's uncomfortable. It's not happening. And I can prove it to you, I can prove it to you with my agency. This is the NIH PrimeMed trial. Anybody heard of this trial? Right? 8,719 patients. This is how they defined acceptable quality CPR. Acceptable quality CPR, all of these things, and a compression fraction of over 50%. Everybody know what compression fraction is? It's the amount of time you're on the chest versus the amount of time you're off the chest. A compression fraction of 50% is acceptable quality CPR in this study. This is a national study with almost 9,000 people in it. That means if you have a 30 minute code, how much time are you off the chest? 15 minutes. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? You're off the chest 15 minutes? How about you have somebody on ECMO? Everybody know what ECMO is, right? You got somebody on ECMO and you decide just to turn the freaking machine off for 15 out of 30 minutes. What is that patient? Dead. He's dead. This is the primate trial. 50% compression fraction is acceptable. This is, I was teaching in uh, Indonesia, and I'll give you the, the, the short story here. We did a CPR feedback challenge, so we took 100 medical professionals in Jakarta, stuck them in a corner, one minute of CPR with feedback, one minute of CPR without feedback. All right? No other distractions, 70 degrees, fluorescent, no family yelling at you, not three in the morning, no cops saying, hey, we gotta do this, nobody's saying I gotta innovate, I gotta give epi, I gotta do an IO, I can't get here, I can't do that, somebody flush the toilet, right, whatever, right? <laughs> you ever been there? Like, oh, dude, somebody flush that toilet, <clears throat> right? Nothing else going on, one minute, one minute in the corner of a room with no distractions. Without feedback, whoop, can I go back? Yeah, I can. Without feedback, they were in rate and depth target 13.15% of the time. 
13% of the time. One minute, no distractions. With feedback, 47% of the time. Now that's markedly better, right? I mean, so I hate to say it this way, but if you are not using feedback, you should call the frickin' coroner, right? Because you're just not, you're doing 13% of the time. There's no reason to, there's no reason to do compressions. If you are using feedback, you're 47% of the time, which means that you're off the chest or not in the right rate and depth. How much? 53% of the time. 53% of the time. These are medical professionals in the corner of a room, one minute, no distractions. And you're telling me you're doing a good job at three in the morning with a yelling and screaming family and a bunch of other stuff going on. I don't think it's happening. This is us, this is my department in the last six months uh, on a patient that didn't meet the auto pulse criteria, so we were doing manual compressions. You can see 10% uh, in depth, average 1.6, 0% in depth, average 3.6, 1% in the target rate, average 152. This is pitiful. And my guys focus on it. My guys focus on it. These numbers are terrible. And if you're not looking at data, by the way, if you don't get data like this, then you're, you're in a world of hurt. Because everybody thinks they're doing a great job until they actually look at the data and go, oh, not so great. Not so great. So this is a same manual compressions. You'll see 47 second pause, 35 second pause, 25 second pause. Still a, almost an 80% compression fraction, but still means you're off the chest for 10 minutes out of a 30 minute code to some extent. Right, this is manual stuff. So, this is us. In 2009, we got uh, auto pulses, right? We were still on paper PCRs. We're like, uh, okay, this thing makes sense, right? A mechanical CPR device makes sense to us. Uh, we won't know if it works, and we're not going to measure outcomes because we can't, but we implemented the auto pulse. 2015, we got a QI coordinator, right? Because I was the EMS division before that. Uh, you know, division of one, basically. And so we started doing electronic uh, patient care records and we got an, a QI coordinator and we looked at it and said, okay, where are we at? We're at 23%. Okay. It's not bad. It's not where it should be, but it's not where we thought it should be. 23%. Why is that not better? Why is that number not better? We're using these auto pulses, they do continuous compressions, they're great things, why is that not better? Because we're doing it wrong. Okay, so nothing trumps compressions, nothing. So I want you to tell me, a little group participation, when I fall off this thing, by the way, you guys can fix me up or something, right? Take me to a trauma center, come right around here. <clears throat> um, tell me, what trumps compressions? Just give me one thing, come on, you guys think. So I'll, I'll give you one thing, scene safety trumps compressions. You give me that? I'll give you that. Right, somebody shooting at you or something, right? In my city, people shoot at you every once in a while. Right, you should get out of there, right? Well, what else? What else trumps? What care trumps compressions? Hmm. Shockable rhythm? I would disagree, but about that. But we'll go from there. But so pretty much we agree that nothing trumps compressions, right? But we, across the board, stop compressions for just about everything, right? We we stop compressions to innovate. We stop compressions to get a line sometimes, we stop compressions to check a rhythm, we stop compressions to check a pulse, all of those things. But we all agree nothing trumps compressions, but we're just gonna stop, keep stopping compressions. Does that make any sense? Does that make any sense? I don't think so. So this, this is an auto pulse, by the way. Um, if you guys have or haven't used auto pulses, um, absolutely worthless. 
completely worthless. I think they're like 15 grand, or maybe they're less than that now. I don't, 10 grand, I have no idea. <coughs> um, but you shouldn't spend a cent on them. Any idea why? Because they got a button right here. See the little orange button? Anybody know what that little orange button does? It stops it. It pauses the device. So my problem is we implement the auto pulse. Say, hey, our numbers should be great, right? Those numbers should be fantastic. And they're not. And like we start going out and looking at watching guys run calls and we're like, oh dude, don't stop the device. Oh yeah, we're not. No, no, you are. No, no, we're not, right? No, I watched, right? Well, okay, okay, we, have, we won't stop the device. And then we go back and look at the data on the next call and the next call and say, hey, stop stopping the device. We're not. No, you are, right? We go through this process and they're finally like, well, you mean don't stop it unless we have to innovate or don't stop it unless we have to check a rhythm or don't stop it unless we have to check a pulse or, no, I mean don't stop the damn thing. Turn it on and don't turn it off. Period. So it took a while. So as long as you can get this orange button to not be used, phenomenal device. They keep pausing it, you might as well throw it away. This is a compression fraction rate uh, with some of our auto pulse patients. You see up here 92%, 86% better, not perfect, but better. These are usually the first few minutes that we're there before we get the auto pulse on. So look at the pauses here, look at the difference. Pauses, 4.4 seconds, 4.3 seconds, 2.3 seconds. And you can't really see all the times over here, all these times are, uh, 14, 15 minutes. Any idea why they're all 14, 15 minutes? All those patients got ROSC, right about that period of time. So we see, when you look at the data, we see that between 12 and 15 minutes of continuous compressions, if we're gonna get ROSC, we're gonna get ROSC. The moment you pause it, the moment you stop it, you could buy yourself another 12 to 15 minutes of continuous compression before you get a ROSC again. Every time you pause it. You wanna pause it three or four times, well, the last time you pause it, give it another 12 or 15 minutes. So this is a classic, by the way, if you're not getting data like this, if you're not looking at your data and looking at your actual data on an actual call, you, you're, you're gonna be a little bit in trouble, right? Because what's gonna, what I ask these guys is, hey, did you pause the auto pulse? And they tell me, nope. Of course I don't, Joe, right? <laughs> All right. So what's this, right? <laughs> Those are pauses, right? I go, oh, oh yeah, all right, yeah, I guess we did pause the auto pulse. So you really need to be getting data like this. You look at uh, end tidal CO2, you know, above 40 throughout this process in here. As soon as we do this, it drops down in the teens. So, You guys define your acceptable pauses of CPR in writing. This is what is acceptable. This is when you can pause the auto pulse. You define it in writing? Because we say if you don't define the acceptable pauses in writing, you'll have more pauses than are acceptable every time. You should define them in writing. These are the acceptable pauses of CPR. So, and what you'll see here is that everything on this gets me something. I have a direct benefit to patient care by pausing the device. I'm, I'm buying something when I'm pausing that device. And if you're not buying something, then don't pause it, right? All right, so one second to place a feedback device or a puck or whatever you guys use for feedback on an actual patient, right? That tells us how we do CPR for the rest of the device. They give me high quality CPR throughout the rest of the, the code, right? Place a posterior defibrillation pad, five seconds. So we're putting our pads here and here, by the way, anterior, posterior, because that's more effective, one, and it gets this pad out of the way of my auto pulse band so I can see through CPR better. Not perfect, but better. We'll talk about that when we talk about defibrillation, so. Um, place a mechanical CPR device, five seconds. Come on, come on, Joe, or dude, 
Come on, dude. You cannot put an auto pulse on in five seconds. Anybody agree? Anybody done it or tried? You can't do it, right? So that's not the question, though. The question here is how long are you off the chest to put an auto pulse on? Like getting to be off the chest for five seconds or less to put an auto pulse on. So we can show you how that works. We're only off the chest five seconds to put the device on. And then two seconds to start the device. Right, because it's got a sensor on the back and his band's got to measure the chest and you can't touch a patient during that time. So you got, a, got a two seconds there. But, so everything on there is buying you something. That's why you stop CPR, because it's going to buy you something very important. Uh, <clears throat> so when you check a cardiac arrest patient, right, when you check a rhythm, hey, let's check a rhythm. We should check that rhythm. First off, what do you care about that rhythm? You only care about two things. You only care about two things. You only care whether it's V-fib or not V-fib, right? What else do you care about? Hmm. Right, but if their end CO2 is not up, we don't see a spike in end CO2, they don't have a pulse, right? So when I check a rhythm, I want to know one thing and one thing only. Do they or do they not? Are they, are they, are they or are they not in V-fib? That's all I care about. So we're not going to do this, right? How do we normally do this? Hey, guys, let's check our rhythm. So we either stop CPR, and then we all get the popcorn and the 3D glasses, and we look at the patient and look at the monitor and go, I don't know. Do you think that's an atrial rhythm, or it could be ventricular? That could be a PAC with a few PJCs. I'm not sure. <clears throat> right? And we spend 20 minutes, 30 minutes, or 20, 20 or 30 seconds looking at the rhythm. And, and that's not how we should do that. First off, for us, if the end of CO2 isn't over 20, I'm not going to defibrillate it. So guess what? I'm not going to look. I don't even care what the rhythm is. I don't even care if it's V-fib. But outside of that, if the end tidal CO2 is over 20, and I might defibrillate it if it's V-fib, this is how you check a rhythm. You go, okay, guys, I, I can't see the underlying rhythm all that well. I'm not sure that's V-fib or not. So we're going to check, we're going to pause to check a rhythm. One guy reaches over, pushes print on the monitor. Another guy reaches over that little orange button, goes pause, one, 1,000, two, 1,000, starts it back up. Two seconds, pull out the strip. Is that V-fib or is that not? And if everybody wants to admire the strip, they can pass it around while compressions are going, right? Not the other way around. So we got to do this differently. We've got to do this differently. All right, learning from other medical innovations. So ACLS was created in the third national conference in CPR in 1979. Survival was about 8%. What do we say ROSC is now? Nineteen seventy-nine Hodgkin's lymphoma. Five percent survival. Twenty eighteen. Ninety two percent. Nineteen seventy-nine, we started the AIDS crisis. Survival was essentially zero. Now almost 100%. So the treatment of both of those, Hodgkin's and AIDS, required multiple interventions, not a single intervention, right? What's it called in AIDS? It's the, the, the cocktail, right? Three or four drugs, I can't remember exactly, right? Three or four drugs that got them there. And same with Hodgkin's, right? We started out with one drug that didn't work. And then we got rid of that drug and we started out with a second drug. It didn't work. We got rid of that drug, started the third drug. That didn't work. Like, hmm, this doesn't work. Or we started combining drugs and saying, oh, well, what if we do A plus B? What if we do A plus B plus C? So it's that bundle of care. It's that synergy, right, that got us there. It's that bundle of care. Not one thing fixed it. And not one thing is going to fix our 90% death rate from cardiac arrest. It's a bundle of care. So this is our cardiac survivability toolbox. This is the seven things we do on a regular basis 
to get us there. So we just talked about continuous uninterrupted compressions. We'll talk about use of an impedance threshold device or a rescue pod. APNIC oxygenation. Heads up CPR. Delaying defibrillation. Expanded use of waveform capnography. And deprioritizing epi. That's how we get where we are with our numbers. So this is a rescue pod. Anybody use rescue pods? Rescue pod? No, nobody uses rescue pods? There you go, okay, nice job. <laughs> <clears throat> Anybody know what this does? Very simply, it creates a negative pressure in the chest by not allowing all the air to go back in, right, on the, on the upstroke of the compression. And so a negative pressure in the chest draws blood out of the brain and into the, into the heart. It improves cardiac output, also decreases ICP and increases cerebral perfusion. So this is not a one-way problem. We tend to think as medics and nurses and sometimes doctors that this is a, this is a blood in problem. It's not a blood in problem, it's a blood in blood out problem. <clears throat> firemen, is there firemen in the room, right? Yeah, do we pump water one direction into a deadhead hydrant or into another engine, if it doesn't go anywhere, then does the water flow? Does the pump overheat, right? You gotta get the water out, get the water in. You gotta get the blood out of the brain to get good, oxygenated, proper pH blood back into the brain. And so it's a, it's a two-part system. We think it's a one-part system. It's a two-part system. We gotta get the blood out. It's a closed system. And so creating a negative pressure in the chest draws blood out of the brain, better, better cardiac output back into the brain, less ICP, better cerebral perfusion. So, better neurologic outcome. We introduced the rescue pod in 2015. With continuous compressions, we went from 23% uh, to 40% with the rescue pod. 17% jump in ROSC. Not bad, not bad. Apneic oxygenation, we had a, uh, <clears throat> When we started saying do not turn the, the auto pulse off to innovate, our, our innovation success rate went down about 10%. So we said, what are we gonna do here? Well, we gotta learn how to do this. We're not gonna stop the auto pulse. We're not gonna stop compressions. So we gotta figure out some better way to do that. So we did a couple of things. We went to a, a cadaver lab in Texas, and I'll show you a couple of short videos from that. Um, <clears throat> we also put them on apneic oxygenation. So our patients get put on a nasal cannula at 15 liters before intubation. How long do you normally have to intubate? As long as you can hold your breath, 20, 30 seconds. How long do you have to intubate in, in my system? <clears throat> I don't care. I do not give a crap how long it takes you to intubate. I don't care if it takes you five minutes. Get their SATs up, get their entitled CO2 where it should be between 35 and 45. And you can take five minutes to innovate. I don't care. Just don't stop the auto pulse. This is the, cat, the um, cadaver lab in Texas. Do a little heads up positioning there. That was all of about eight seconds. <clears throat> so this really makes me mad, by the way. How many? How long in your life have you innovated laying on your belly? in the middle of the vomit or whatever on some of those carpets that are really impressive, right? That you don't wanna walk on, let alone lay on. Anybody, come on. Who's innovated on their belly? Yeah. <clears throat> so my chief comes along and goes, hey, why don't we put them on a gurney and put them heads up? <sighs> so all of our patients get innovated on a gurney with a 30 degree heads up. Gets all this stuff out of the way, gives you nice visualization. So this patient's relatively flat, but Everybody gets innovated on a gurney. And I know, do you know what the problem with innovating people on a gurney is? It means we gotta put them on a gurney. So what's the problem with that? Actually, the compression is down with the auto falls while we're lifting. The problem with that is the gurney's got wheels. It does, it's got wheels. Which means it's gotta do what? It's gotta go to the hospital. There's a law, I think there's a federal law. If you put somebody on a gurney and it's got wheels, anything with wheels has to move. 
we have a stay on scene for 30 minute policy. So like, how do we do this? How do we put them on the gurney? And then not move them. Yeah, don't move them, right? It's a tool. It's a tool to help you innovate. It's a tool. <clears throat> then you get the, well, what are we gonna do? But, 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 but Joe, what are we gonna do if we happen to call them and they're on the gurney? I'm a genius. We take them off the gurney. Yeah, now we take them off the gurney. I know it's crazy, it's crazy stuff. This is a 30 degree heads up position. We also use three people usually to innovate, so somebody hands you the tube, so you never take your eyes off the prize. <clears throat> this is a uh, trachea, obviously, um, of a patient with auto pulse going. So there's not as much movement as we thought there were uh, in that process. We got to thank um, this young lady who gave her body to us to to do this. She had uh, passed away of cancer just a couple hours earlier, and so um, we got to thank her and the Center for uh, Emerging Health Sciences in Spring Branch, Texas, Texas, that allowed us to put an auto pulse on a cadaver because nobody else would. You can't do that. You can't put an auto pulse on a cadaver. They're dead, right? <laughs> Heads up CPR. This is my QI guy, Kevin, who looks much better with his shirt off, you know, on a gurney, so he gets to take the picture. This is, you know, heads up CPR is complex. We're gonna put the head up, right? And if we want blood to go out of the brain and back to the heart, decrease ICP, and then fill the heart so we have good perfusion. If I got blood here, and, and I want it to go here, I'm gonna do this, right? And now blood's gonna go back, right? So heads up CPR is a relatively simple process, costs you nothing to do. Decreases ICP, increases cerebral perfusion, better cardiac output, freebie, it's a freebie. Unfortunately, it's really hard to do uh, manual compressions in a heads up CPR uh, model, so you need some kind of a mechanical device to do it. This is, a, this is a pig study. This is ICP, and you can see at zero degrees, 10 degrees, 20 degrees, 30 degrees, 40 degrees, how ICP goes down. And you can see how cerebral perfusion at zero, up to 50, cerebral perfusion goes up. The reason we're at 30 is because there is some coronary perfusion issues after about 40 degrees, so 30 degrees is about the, about the sweet spot. We are currently doing regional oximetry. So we just rolled it out about a month and a half ago. So frontal lobe oxygen saturation, I can tell you nothing about what that means to us yet. <laughs> I can tell you that we're trying, we're trying to figure out what those numbers look like and what they mean to us. Um, but the frontal lobe of the brain, the farthest away from the heart, we wanna know how much oxygen we're getting to the frontal lobe of the brain and how all of these tools are affecting that. So we're using regional oximetry now. The problem is that this device is actually a, a surgical device, so it's, it's made for in-hospital, and so my fireman can break it. When I talked to the non-in folks and said, hey, I wanna, I wanna uh, try out regional oximetry, and they said, no problem, I said, hey, uh, my guys are gonna break this, right? <laughs> what do you wanna do? They said, just give me a call. I'm like, all right, we rolled it out. A couple weeks ago, I called them up and said, hey, I broke it, I promised. <laughs> all right, we'll send you another one. <clears throat> this should change the way we do cardiac arrest. In a year, year and a half, when we have the data on each one of those tools, we know how well we're perfusing the frontal lobes of the brain. It should change what we know. We just don't know what that is yet. So we base all of our care off capnography currently. Why? What does capnography mean to you? Capnography means that there's a cell, right? Inside the body that's taking oxygen, changing it to ATP, going through that whole process, putting out carbon dioxide, right? Right? There's something alive doing something in there. So we base all of our care off capnography. Our defibrillation determination, quality of CPR, ventilation rate and depth. How fast are you supposed to ventilate a patient that's not breathing? AHA guidelines, how fast? 10 to 12 times a minute. 10 to 12 times a minute, right? How fast do my guys ventilate? 
Yeah, I don't care. I do not give a crap. I don't care if you're ventilating once a minute or 30 times a minute. I don't care. I want their saturation to be above 85% and I want their end CO2 to be between 35 and 45. I don't care. We cannot continue to do medicine that way. What some book somewhere says, no, 10 to 12 times a minute. Why do they tell you that exact number? I'm gonna make some people unhappy, but. Because they think you're too stupid to determine how fast your patients should be ventilated. You don't have the knowledge to make a determination. Your patient should be ventilated on saturation and tidal CO2 number. Not on some random, random number that applies to everybody throughout the entire world, regardless of their medical condition. You kidding me? Time on scene. So we'll talk about time on scene. ROSC, why do we use capnography to determine ROSC? Because I don't want to use a pulse, because I don't want to stop the autopulse or stop compressions to check for a pulse. Nothing trumps compression, so I'm not going to stop the autopulse to check for a pulse. I'm going to use antitalo CO2. And determination of death. That's what we're using it for. All right, so we talked a little bit about asystole and those patients. So we've instituted a 30 minute criteria. If our patients have an end tidal CO2 of over 20, then you have to stay on scene for 30 minutes. Talk about a culture change. <laughs> That's not pretty, right? You gotta sit there for 30 minutes. So we're getting those asystole patients back right about 20, 25 minutes. So they gotta stay on scene for 30 minutes for a couple of reasons. One is at the hospital, what are they doing when I get the patient to the hospital? Off the autopulse, off the rescue pod, lay them flat, do manual compressions for 10 minutes and call them. Okay, so I want to take them to the hospital. I apologize, right? So the other issue is that who has a better ROS rate? My guys in the field or the hospital? I got 60%. My local trauma center is running about 31%. So tell me, you tell me why I put those people in an ambulance and decrease the quality of compressions, decrease the quality of care while I'm trying to get them in an ambulance and get them all set up and get them out of the ambulance and the hospital, take them code three, risk their lives, risk my citizens' lives, to take them someplace where I'm gonna decrease their survivability by 30%. Tell me why. That doesn't make any sense. So I'm gonna do it right here, right now in the, house, in the house. So we went from, on average, the first half of 2017, and you can see those numbers are new, right? We're new at this. 2017, we're on scene average of 13 minutes, because I can put four or five medics on scene in about eight minutes. 23% ROSC. We told them to stay on scene for 30 minutes. Average on scene time with 24 minutes, 42% ROSC. I'll take it. Free, I didn't charge me anything except for they're gonna have some units committed a little longer. Not very much longer, but a little longer. And now we got all the time in the world to innovate, all the time in the world to assess a patient, do what we need to do. So 42% non-shockable. Recently had a doctor tell us um, that's impossible, it's not happening. Um, at the future resuscitation conference. It's not, you're, you're full of it. I walked out of the room. <laughs> And he's a, he's a fairly well-known resuscitation doctor. He came back, we talked, but. Ah. This is a quote from my QI coordinator. And once again, we're geniuses. You can tell by the quote. Early defibrillation is early until it isn't. So I agree with AHA. I agree the earlier the patient gets defibrillated, the better until it no longer is effective. Early defibrillation is the first three or four minutes, right? And then the blood gets acidotic, the blood starts clotting, it gets hypoxic, the heart is not receptive to electrical energy. You guys all getting there in three or four minutes? I have a hard time getting my guys out the door in three or four minutes sometimes, right? <laughs> how, how long till you're there? 
and doing quality compressions, changing pH, changing hypoxia. Come on, that's 10 minutes till you're there, another couple minutes till you evaluate the patient, see they're in B-fib, and then what do you do? You do this, right? You shock this guy into asystole, and you never get him back. We've all done it. Don't tell me everybody in the room hasn't done it. You shock that guy, you get there, and you put him on some pads, and you see he's in B-fib, and you shock him into asystole, and he's dead. Why? Why do you defibrillate that guy? Because the book says you're supposed to. What's your goal for defibrillation? What is your goal? It is to put that patient into a rhythm that perfuses his brain. Is that not your goal? Yeah, I'm with you. With me, come on. Yeah, that's your goal. Your goal isn't to do what the book says or just to defibrillate. Your goal is to put him into a rhythm that will perfuse his brain. But we know that 99% of the time when you defibrillate that patient when they're hypoxic, acidotic, and clotting, they're going to go into a and they're going to die. We can't do medicine like that. Why don't they say, hey, you shock the heart when the heart's ready to get to deliver, to get energy. So we use an end of CO2 of over 20, right? <clears throat> so let me clear up a couple things. So witness V-fib, different story, you witnessed it, right? You should shock that stuff. I haven't used one bad word yet, but <clears throat> you should shock that stuff. <laughs> so witness V-fib, shock it. Course V-fib, you should shock it. V-fib with an end of CO2 of over 20, you should shock it. Anything else, you shouldn't shock it until it's ready. Wait till the heart's ready for energy. Shock and V-fib, uh, under 20 in our system. 9% ROS rate. 9%. Shock and V-fib over 20 in our system. 73% ROS rate. Now, there's, there's possibly some confounding factors there, right? Now, tell me I should shock everybody. <sighs> Always winning friends here. Um, so if we don't give the drug, he'll be more likely to go home and his brain will work better. Epinephrine. Everybody gives epinephrine, right? That's the drug of choice for cardiac arrest. What do we know about it? Real quick, because I'm running out of time here. Um, so what we know in the last study that just came out of the UK, I believe it was, had a, a lot of uh, thousands of patients in it, that, that with epinephrine, higher rate of 30-day survival. All right, give epi, right? Epi's the drug. It is a higher rate of 30-day survival if you give epinephrine. More survivors had severe neurologic impairment. Oh, wait a minute, don't give epinephrine. That's the answer. Or maybe, just maybe there's a sweet spot somewhere. But what I can tell you for sure is you shouldn't give epinephrine when your patient's hypoxic, acidotic, clotting, and is not perfusing well. When they're laying flat, when every compression you're doing is causing ICP spikes and burning cells, giving epinephrine then definitely is causing some brain damage. So I'll give you a couple of quick scenarios. If I gave you the caveat, if I said to you today, I'll guarantee you ROSC. I will guarantee you ROSC, you get to choose. Your wife, your mother, your brother, your daughter, whatever, right? You get to choose whether they get epi. Do you want epi or do you not want epi? I'll guarantee you ROSC, either way. Epi or no epi? No epi, right? Okay, Whew. that makes sense. Now if I tell you, you will not get ROSC without epi. Do you want epi? Uh-huh. So there's probably a sweet spot. When we've done everything we can do, and it's not working and we're not getting there, then we'll give epi. But it's the last thing in the line of treatment, not the first thing. We do all of the other tools long before we give epi. Now our local EMS agency says, you have to give epi immediately upon establishing vascular access. Good, because we established vascular access last, right? It's the last thing we do. Is an IV going to get save lives in cardiac arrest? No. 
Is the epi? Maybe. Later. But the last thing we do is give epi. This is our wheel of survival. <clears throat> um, so the important thing here, and I'm not gonna go over each step, is that it's not just about what you do. It's about how you do it and the order that you do it. And I'm gonna give you 10 seconds of what the, how that makes sense. If the manual CPR or the CPR with an auto pulse, if I change that from the beginning to the end of the scenario, how well is my patient gonna do? If I don't do CPR and I'm telling you all the other rest of stuff. So the order in which you do things is important, very important, which is why we create this wheel of survival and we, have, we make sure everything's done in a certain order. Very important. So this is where we are right now. This is before the toolbox. Uh, we were 23%. So once we've instituted the uh, ITD or the rescue pod, we were 40%. All tools, all seven tools, we were at 60% ROSC. And our SD number that year was 83%. Last year was actually 86%. So we got Ross back on 86% of our ST patients. That's where we are currently. So no magic ingredient. So this is where we have all of our tools in place. Remember we're at 60%? If we take away one tool, we're at 55. Two tools, we're about 47. Three tools, we're at 40. And we're back to 2015. 23% if we just use the auto pulse. The problem is that the same thing happens regardless of which tool you take away. You go back and run the data and you take away any of those tools, you get about the same stuff. So it's not any one tool. Everybody wants to say, hey Joe, hey dude, what's the one thing? What's the one thing that I should do? Sorry, there is no one thing. There is no one thing. It's a bundle of care, it's a bundle of care. Yeah, that says, uh, whoops, sorry, let me go back. That says Rialto Fire Department. That is our brush engine. This is a brush fire that our brush engine didn't quite get to. So um, you wouldn't believe how many Union Pacific Railroad police come out of the woodwork when you say, hey, I need to close your, close your rail line down, by the way. About $2 million an hour. The guy, the cop says, hey, I'm slowing down trains east of the Mississippi. I don't even know that's possible, right? So, and we, had, we couldn't just drag that thing off, we had to lift it off, right, because we're gonna ruin the tracks. Everybody in the cab, everybody in the cab of that vehicle, before they did it, knew it was a bad idea. All four of them, bad idea. Anybody say anything? Nope. A little crew resource management. You wouldn't believe how many things we've screwed up in cardiac arrest survivability. We've screwed up a ton of stuff. We made a ton of mistakes. We incrementalized, we went back and looked at the data. Guy's not doing it, guy's not compliant. We're still not 100% compliant with all of our tools with everybody. So if you think we rolled it out all in one beautiful package with a bow on it, we told everybody once that it's perfect, <laughs> it's not, right? It's, it's a work in progress, it's gonna be a continual work in progress. But learn from your failures. Nobody in our cardiac arrest environment has ever been disciplined. They've had plenty of discussions in my office. Nobody's ever been disciplined. Better tomorrow. We're gonna be better tomorrow every day. Better tomorrow. We make mistakes, we screw up, we learn from them, we're better tomorrow. We celebrate all of our successes. This is our, our city. And what you can see here in the city is that we have four stations up north and we've got this line here called the Randall Line of Death. So nobody survives below Randall the Randall line of death. We also have a train that goes by here. It's about 16,000 people down there. We've got a train that runs right through the middle of our city about 30 times a day and stops at a train station right in the middle of the city, which stops the entire northbound, southbound traffic. So we move that line up there. It's about 22,000 people that we can't get to that we're not servicing and they're not living cardiac arrest. So we've been trying to build a station down south, station 205 for about 30 years. We have huge target hazards down there. 
We have huge rail stations. We've got huge tank farms, a ton of industrial. For 30 years, we wouldn't give us a dime. We said, we can guarantee you through cardiac survivability, we're killing people south of Randall. And they said, how much you need? I need to build a station. I need Manning. OK, you got it. It doesn't hurt, by the way, that one of my city council members lives right there. <laughs> Him and his family. So we got station 205 out of it, out of our cardiac survivability numbers. OK, so I got 21 seconds remaining. <laughs> so we're going to talk for, for more than 21 seconds, but just for a few seconds about the moonshot. We made significant changes in survivability. We're currently about 18% survival to discharge across all rhythms, across all patients. So 18% survival to discharge. That's up from what the national average is, 3 to 4%. <clears throat> so we've decided to set some goals for 2030. With technology, with Moore's Law, with computing speed doubling every 18 months, it's actually every 13 months now. With the technology that we got, with the people that we have on board, we have a lot of other folks on board uh, that, are, that are now starting to do what we're doing and crunching data and looking at new tools. We're going to roll out the rescue pump here in the next couple weeks. We have a goal in 2030. I've never, I've never said this in any forum with, with anybody. So this is the first time I've ever actually said this. So this is our goal. 50.1% 50 neurologically intact survival to discharge by January 1, 2030. 50.1%. How am I going to do it? You want me to tell you how I'm going to do it? I have no freaking idea. I need data. I need people. I need people thinking differently than the way we've always thought. I need new technologies. I need CPR faster. I need hands on the chest faster. I need, so I wear a Fitbit. Even though you probably say, he doesn't wear a Fitbit, come on. Right? I wear a Fitbit usually, right? That Fitbit can tell me whether I'm streaming or not, and whether I'm sleeping or not, and whether that's REM sleep or whether that's deep sleep. And it can tell me my heart rate and tell me all kinds of crazy things. Don't tell me that something like that can't tell me I'm in VFib. Notify my family, notify 911, and we can't get hands on the chest earlier. So we're only one small part of it. And this is not, I'm not saying in Rialto. In Rialto, I want to have 50.1% by 2030. Somewhere in this planet, we're going to all together have one, one agency. Somebody's going to hit 50.1%. So over half of our patients will survive the discharge. So right now at 18%, 82% of my patients are dying. That's unacceptable. That's unacceptable in my city. We got to be there. And the only way I can get there is with your guys' help. Real people, right? This means real people. They're not just numbers, but they're people that are living, walking and talking in my city. One more Christmas, one more Easter, one more Thanksgiving, one more day with their wife, their husband, their grandkids. They're real people, not just numbers. So this is my information. I will get back with you. If you have any questions, any concerns, if you want to challenge me on anything or you want to just talk about it, my chief says go out and save the world. So that's what we're doing. Feel free to reach out. And some references, so you can look up all the data if you want. I'll put you back here. All right, that's all I got for you.